speaker this evening is Dr. Douglas Moo. He is at Wheaton College, and um, again, I could go into all of his accolades and everything else, but again, we all know how special both Dr. Moo and Dr. Brennan are, so I'll invite him up. Uh, session number one in your handout, he's going to be speaking on God, Gospel, and Righteousness, what Romans is all about to set the stage for the rest of our time. So Dr. Moo, thank you. Thank you. Uh, they never make these high enough. So <laughs> always too low. You, you, you agree with that, do you? Okay. Uh, for the uh, PowerPoint, is this what's going to work for that then? Sorry, as we get settled here. I just would like to, to thank Mark uh, and others who are involved in inviting us here. This is a great opportunity. Uh, for me and my wife to see Hawaii, we've never been to Hawaii before. This is our first visit to anywhere in the state, so we're very much enjoying that. But um, I think my wife would agree with me when I say as we travel in different parts of the world, it's great to see the scenery and so forth, but what's special is meeting brothers and sisters in different parts of the world. Uh, the sense of a common bond in Christ is such a precious thing. We are so appreciative of that. And, Hope to experience that together over these next couple of days. Also want to thank Mark for the lay. Is that what this is called? Um, um, I know he's trying to pass it off as a kind gift. I suspect he has it electronically wired. So if I start going too long, he's got a little button he'll push and he'll start to zap me until I leave the stage. So I, I, I see what, what, what this is about, Mark. I, I know what you're doing here. So. Uh, I'm also thrilled to be able to, uh, to talk to you uh, with my friend and colleague, Tom Schreiner. Uh, it's been an interesting thing to look at our ministries, which, which almost have been in parallel in some of the things we've been interested in and worked on. Um, and I know Tom probably did the same thing I've done as I was writing my commentary on Romans. I was reading his, and he was probably reading mine. And, um, you know, I think at some point I said to myself, I'm, I'm not sure I need to write mine. Tom's is already there. I mean, I'm not saying much that's different. So you'll hear a few differences from us explicitly in the debates we're having that Mark introduced. Uh, but also you might detect little differences of emphasis here and there. And that would be great for you to pick up on in the question and answer session. Um, Romans is a great letter, a complicated letter and uh, it's difficult to interpret and any two human beings are going to come to slightly different opinions. We want to keep that in context though and make very clear that the basic message of Romans is absolutely clear. Uh, and no matter who is doing the reading, no matter who is doing the interpreting, uh, God has given us a word that we can understand appreciate and respond to, and we have to make sure we keep that vision in mind. Uh, and I hope that at the end of this time, you leave with a good sense of what Romans is about, what God is trying to teach us here, uh, and will not get distracted by some of the differences of opinion here and there uh, that are not ultimately maybe all that significant. Um, you probably know why we read Romans, but just to uh, illustrate the point with three of the great theologians of the uh, church uh, talking about the importance of this letter to the Romans uh, and the tremendous theological significance of this letter that God inspired Paul to write and make part of our holy scripture. Um, Luther, the purest gospel, as he called Romans, Calvin, if we have gained a true understanding of this epistle, we have an open door to the most profound treasures of scripture. And he's suggesting something here that, that I will at least try to bring out a bit, um, that Romans, among other things, gives us guidance on how to read the whole Bible. Uh, it addresses certain kinds of issues that help us put this book together. Uh, 66 books written over thousands of years by many different people with many different personalities in many different forms, history, 
prophecy, gospel, letters, apocalypse, uh, and yet it's one book ultimately. And I think one of the things that Romans does is help us uh, to read the Bible as this single book ultimately that God has given to us. And finally, Wesley, Paul labors to produce in those to whom he writes a deep sense of the excellency of the gospel and labors to engage them to act suitably to it. If you know anything about your church history, you will not be surprised at that practical note from Wesley. Uh, not taking anything away from the tremendous theological accomplishments of Luther and Calvin and their deep desire to instill those truths in people so that they might be transformed. It was especially characteristic of Wesley in his day to remind the church that theology has a purpose. Uh, that theology is not just something to be discussed or debated or written. Theology is something that's supposed to transform human lives and human communities. Uh, and I appreciate that emphasis of Wesley as we come to Romans, which a lot of people, you know, have this idea, oh, this high theology, all this deep doctrinal stuff. And yeah, that's there. But all of that deep doctrinal stuff is designed ultimately to help us know what it means to love Christ, to serve him, and to be more effective as his disciples. And uh, I need to keep that in mind. I can get so interested in Romans for its own sake, for theology for its own sake, that I can maybe lose sight of that sometimes. So you'll have to help me with that. You know, Just raise a hand or something or interrupt and say, Dr. Moo, you're getting too ethereal for us here. Let's, let's bring things back to reality a little bit. Romans is this great theological document, and we're going to hopefully see that uh, as we move through the letter these next couple of days. But it is, at the same time, a letter. Uh, think of a letter you write. Probably have a hard time remembering one, right? I have to go back 30 or 40 years. Think of an email. Never mind. Think of a message. Never mind. Think of a tweet. Uh, trying to be as up-to-date as I can be here. Um, uh, when you write these things, you are writing them for a purpose, aren't you? Very rarely do you just sit down at your computer and say, eh, I just feel like writing an email. I'm just going to write an email and send it off to whomever. Uh, no, uh, someone writes to us and we respond. We've heard that someone has an issue and we want to talk to them about it. We want to address that. We compose an email. We send it to them as a particular occasion. Romans is a letter also written on a definite occasion. There are reasons why Paul writes this letter with these themes and topics at this time to these people. And I hope you've learned by now something so fundamental to reading the Bible well is to have some sense of the context of the biblical book that you are reading and trying to understand. Some idea of uh, why was an author writing this particular book? What was the situation being addressed? It's often gonna be very important in understanding communication well. I'm sure you've had the experience that I have all too often. I, I one of these peculiar People, you know, as a student of scripture and a scholar, you would think that I would love libraries, right? Not so much. I have a hard time studying in a library. I very, very rarely spend any time in a library. I have two research assistants at Wheaton. I make them fetch all my books for me. I actually do a lot of my research and writing in coffee shops. I, I seem to work better with noise around me, maybe because we had five kids and uh, trying to write with five kids running around the house has made noise uh, something that is, is very uh, common and easy for me to deal with. But you're sitting at a coffee shop, you've all been there, and someone's on their cell phone. And of course, speaking very loudly on their cell phones, you wonder why they need the phone sometimes. Um, and you can't help overhearing, right? And you're trying to block it out, but you can't help yourself, you get a little bit intrigued. You know. What in the world's going on that this person is, is speaking the way they are, are making the points they are making? 
And, and you begin, inevitably, at least I do, to start doing some guessing about that. I wonder what, who this other person is they're talking to, uh, you know? I wonder what the issue is. I wonder what they're saying. Well, it's a little bit like reading a book of the scripture. We hear Paul talking to the Romans, but we don't hear what the Romans have said to Paul. We don't understand all of what was going on in the Roman church at the time, because the only information we have about that comes from Romans itself, trying to read Romans and sort of move from what Paul says to make some good guesses about what the situation was he addresses. Now, I, I wanna make a point here that, that on the one hand, we need to do what I'm talking about. We need to try to get a sense of the occasion and the situation because we can read scripture more accurately then. 30 years ago, I was in my office when I was teaching at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. My secretary sat right outside my office and she heard me say on the phone, honey, burn those Bibles. And she probably assumed uh, something that she'd been suspecting for some time, that, that Dr. Boo had gone apostate, that he was giving up the faith, wasn't surprised to her probably. But she didn't hear my wife say, honey, those books we got from that person are all full of bugs. So burn them, I said. Context makes a difference. However, at the same time, sometimes we New Testament scholars try to understand beyond what the evidence allows us to understand. And we create scenarios that are maybe not all that clear. And you see what you, what you can do then, you create a scenario and say, well, Paul is writing to address issue X, and then suddenly you're taking the whole letter of Romans and crafting it to match that issue X. There's great danger at this point of not reading the word accurately, but actually of twisting the word by forcing it into a framework. So as we think about Romans, we wanna to try to get some sense of the situation, but without becoming more specific than the evidence allows us to be. So what's going on in Romans? What, what led Paul to write this? Well, here we get the best information at the end of the letter. Our New Testament letters are usually divided into three really basic parts. And you didn't need to come here to learn this. An introduction, a body, and a conclusion. And often it's in that introduction and conclusion that we learn a lot about the circumstances of the letter. Now in Romans, the introduction is 1, 1 to 17, which we're gonna look at in a few moments here. And then there's a very long conclusion, the longest by far in any of the letters Paul wrote, 15, 14 to the end of chapter 16. Very long conclusion, partly probably because Paul is writing to a church he did not found, to a church he's never even visited before. So he's, he's kind of transgressing a little bit on someone else's territory. At least that's how some could view it. Paul doesn't view it that way, but some people could view it that way. So it seems he spends more time than usual trying to talk about circumstances and background so he can kind of uh, uh, make a common cause with these Roman Christians that he's never physically met before. We're not gonna have time to spend much time in this section of Romans at all, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say. But what I wanna look at is at the end of chapter 15 where Paul does talk a little bit about the circumstances. And we can focus here on the geography. First, there is a backward look. Uh, Paul talks about his uh, preaching, the gospel from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. Now I'm sure a learned audience like this knows where Illyricum is, right? Anyone heard of Illyricum before, ever in your lives? Uh, not surprised, it's not a very important part of the world. Uh, basically, it was a Roman province in Paul's day that kind of was where Macedonia, Albania, Serbia would be today, the modern nations, if you have any kind of sense of 
of the map in your mind of where that might be, north of Greece, just a little bit. Uh, Paul is saying, I have now preached the gospel and planted significant churches all the way from Jerusalem up through Illyricum that would cut through places like the first missionary churches of Lystra and Derbe, Antioch, Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica. These are, are cities famous to us because Paul has written letters to them, of course. So, so Paul is basically saying, you know, in this part of the world, I've done what God called me to do. I've not converted every human being in these areas. I've not even sp sp you know, spread the gospel to every human being in these areas. But what I have done, and this was Paul's sense of his mission, I have planted vibrant churches in these significant metropolitan centers where the Christians in those churches can now do the work of evangelism and discipleship in their areas. Paul is this pioneering church planter. Uh, in the history of the United States, where of course I am from, in the early days as people were spreading across the continent, it used to be said people would move the minute they could see the smoke from someone else's chimney from their front porch. Oh, people are getting too close. I need to move further out. I need to move away, so I'm off on my own somewhere. Paul was like that. He got uncomfortable with too many Christians around. That wasn't his job, you see. So in this significant part of the world, we might call it the Eastern Mediterranean world. Think of the Mediterranean Sea, this Eastern part of the Mediterranean world. Paul says, I've done the work that needs to be done there. So there's this sense as Paul writes Romans that he's reached a significant milestone in ministry. And some of what he's doing in Romans, as we will see, is kind of looking back and, and, and assessing things, kind of saying to himself, all right, after all of these tumultuous years of preaching the gospel and founding churches and debating with false teachers, where am I? What, what is my theology at this point? But Paul is, of course, always looking ahead as well. He has the forward look then with three particular places in mind. Immediately, he's going to Jerusalem. Now, if you know your history from the book of Acts at all, this locates Paul in Acts chapter 20, toward the end of the third missionary journey where he spends the winter in Greece before heading back to Palestine. Uh, He's going to Jerusalem, and he's bringing to Jerusalem a collection of money from the Gentile churches. So if you're looking at Romans 15, and I hope you've got your Bibles open. I should have assumed that, I guess, uh, that you're looking at the texts I'm talking about to make sure uh, I'm not trying to pull one over on you. Uh, but uh, at the end of Romans 15, you'll see Paul talking about this, about how he's going to Jerusalem with a ministry to the saints there. He asks prayer for the ministry. Uh, it's a significant thing Paul is trying to do, you see. One of the clues to what's going on in Romans is that it has become evident in the church of Paul's day that contrary to expectation, the Jewish people have not responded well to the proclamation of Jesus as the Messiah. Some have believed, some in Romans, as we'll see, have certainly believed and are part of the church there. But on the whole, the Jewish people, again and again, where Paul tries to preach the gospel to them in the synagogue, have not responded well to the message of Jesus, sadly. Whereas what has happened is that when Paul leaves the synagogue, and you remember how this happens in the book of Acts again and again, when Paul leaves the synagogue and turns to the Gentiles, he gets a pretty good reception. Many Gentiles respond. So we have to realize as Paul is writing Romans, he is facing the situation. Unexpected, because it wasn't clear from the Old Testament itself that this is how things would have worked. Uh, it's a bit of a surprise, I think it's fair to say. That suddenly this, this new covenant community of God, the people of God, 
has become mainly Gentile. And a lot of what's going on in Romans is an attempt to sort that out. And Paul's immediate desire to go to Jerusalem feeds right into that, you see. He's taking a collection of money from Gentile churches to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Now, obviously, there is the purpose of helping the Jewish Christians. They're suffering. There's been a famine in the area. They need help. At the same time, Paul has clearly a theological motivation here. He's hoping to use this act of giving as a way of bringing the two wings of the church closer together. If he can get the Gentiles giving money to the Jews, and if he can get the Jewish Christians to receive it from the Gentiles, that's going to do something to cement their relationship. So Paul is praying at the end of Romans 15, asking the Romans to pray that when he brings that gift to Jerusalem, it would be received well, that it would accomplish the purpose Paul has for it. Well, after Jerusalem, the next step is Rome. Paul is on his way to Rome. He didn't realize how he was going to get there. He didn't realize at this point that Caesar was going to pay for his trip to Rome uh, by imprisoning him and sending him to Rome for trial. That's how it worked out in the providence of God. But this is Paul's design at this point. He wants to go to Rome uh, in order to have a ministry there among the Christians. Now, interestingly, in Rome at this point, one of the key issues, again, is a Jewish-Gentile conflict. We'll be talking about Romans 14 and 15, if, God willing, we get that far. I trust we will behave ourselves and get there, Dr. Schreiner. Um, uh, but pretty clearly in Romans 14 to 15, this debate about the strong and the weak in the Roman church is basically a division between Jewish and Gentile Christians. Jewish Christians who think, oh, we have to, to work out our faith in Christ by continuing to do the Torah, obeying uh, the Sabbath law, and so forth, the food laws. Whereas the Gentiles are saying, why would we have to bother with that? That's so Old Testament. Uh, that's long ago now. We don't have to bother with that stuff anymore. We're free. We don't need to observe the Sabbath. We can eat anything we want. And you have this division about how the faith should be worked out in the Roman Christian community. And Paul knows this as he writes Romans. That's one of the issues he's addressing. Finally, Paul says his ultimate goal, goal is to go to the opposite end of the Mediterranean Sea. Again, if you have any kind of map in your mind, Turkey at one end of the Mediterranean, Spain at the other. Uh, Paul has been ministering in what we call today Turkey and Greece and Macedonia. Uh, now he's going all the way to Spain at the opposite end of the Mediterranean basin to preach the gospel there. Apparently he feels called by God and maybe there's some Old Testament prophecy that he's reading that might encourage him in this way. Uh, he feels that's the place to go now to plant churches, virgin territory for gospel proclamation. And so he's coming to Rome on his way to Spain. In a sense, what Paul is saying is, and I guess, I don't know, do missionaries do this anymore? Uh, when I was growing up, when missionaries would come to visit from the field, they would show slides. I suppose now it's a PowerPoint or something of the sort. Uh, but they would try to illustrate, you know, here's where we live, here's the kind of ministry we have, here are some of the people we've been working with. In a sense, that's what Paul is doing, see, as he writes to the Romans. He says, is it all right if I come by to your church uh, and tell you about the ministry God has given me and uh, open doors for me in Spain, but I need your help. Spain is a long way from Paul's original sending church in Antioch back in Syria. Completely opposite end of the Mediterranean Sea. So I think he's looking to Rome to provide some support for him, logistical support, money, maybe translators even that he may need in Spain. So, so that's his ultimate goal is to get to Spain. Scholars love to debate things, of course. Uh, that, that's what we get paid to do, uh, to create problems where there aren't any 
problems and then spend a lot of time solving them one way or another and then debating about how we solve them, which creates another set of problems. And well, there it goes. It's an industry that is self-perpetuating. At any rate, um, why did Paul write Romans? Why at this point in his ministry did he write this deeply theological letter to a group of Christians he's never met before? Paul never quite tells us why he writes Romans. But I think these circumstances and the content of the letter itself help us to sort that out a little bit. And I think ultimately there is no single reason for Romans myself. I think there are reasons for Romans. After all, it's a long epistle, what, I think 7,114 words? Now, why that kind of number would stick in my head when I can't remember my own phone number from one day to the next is one of the mysteries of old age, I guess. At any rate, a long epistle where you would expect there to be more than one reason for it. Uh, so thinking about some of the issues we have just looked, like, looked at, sorry. Yeah, Paul is wanting to gain support for his mission in Spain. And in order to get that support, I think one of the things he's trying to do, you see, is to convince the Roman Christians that he is an orthodox guy. He's not a heretic. There are a lot of rumors floating around about Paul because of the very controversial nature of the ministry God gave him to open the way for the Gentiles to come into the kingdom of God. That was very controversial. And you can imagine the rumors that would be circulating about Paul. So one of the things Paul's doing in Romans is saying, hey, don't believe all that stuff. Here's what I really teach and believe. Uh, I'm worthy of support. Second, he is coming to Rome. He's writing to Rome. And like all of the letters of Paul, where he deals with the situation of the churches he's writing to, so in Romans, he wants to heal the split between Jew and Gentile Christians there. He wants to bring unity back into the body of Christ in that part of the world. And ultimately, theologically and pastorally, he wants to help the Roman Christians and through them to help us understand God's plan for creation and for his people. You see, that's how he's going to unify these bickering Christians in Rome, by helping them come to grips with a common vision of the nature of the gospel, its purpose, how to preach it, how to live it. Uh, Paul wants to bring that unity into the church. And as he does that, he addresses some of these big issues we were touching on earlier. Think of the issue that Paul and other Christians were facing. Just, just use your imagination for a moment. You're a uh, Christian, maybe with a Jewish background, uh, you've come to realize that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. You're living, let's say, maybe in 50 or 55 AD. There is no New Testament. Few of those books are being written about then, but probably none are circulating very widely. There is no New Testament. Testament. The Bible consists of the Old Testament only. What does that Old Testament say about how Gentiles should be admitted to the new covenant people of God? Well, the Old Testament has a lot to say about the law and the importance of the law. God gave the law to his people to be observed so that his people could flourish so that his people could be the people of God and the light to the nations that God called them to be. Are people who now are following Jesus as Messiah supposed to do the law? All of it? If not, which parts of it? And how do we know which parts? You see, uh, these, these answers were not immediately obvious. There's no Old Testament text you could turn to that gives direct and clear guidance on some of these issues. 
And so it is understandable that there was a period of time during which the early Christians were having to sort all of this out. Some Christians, more radical Christians of the Gentile background were probably saying, we don't need the Old Testament at all. We can just, you know, be Christ followers without all of that stuff. The other extreme, you probably had very conservative Jewish Christians who insisted, no, no, no. The framework God established in the Old Testament scripture with the law and so forth has to be observed by everybody. That's in place forever, for eternity. We cannot change that. We can't tamper with that. And you have a variety of opinions about this. They're trying to be worked out. Paul, you see, was in the midst of that debate as God used him and other apostles, inspiring them by the Spirit to discover what Paul in Galatians calls the truth of the gospel, that it's offered free of charge to all human beings simply by their faith in Christ, and that once they are in Christ, therefore, they can work out the faith in the ways that God intends for them. Romans has a lot to say about that. A lot of references to the law, the Old Testament scriptures, as we will see. I need to move on, and you're getting tired of all this introductory stuff, so am I. Um, Here's another interesting question to ask. You can say, oh, what's the reason for Romans? Let's debate that for several days. Um, what's the theme of Romans? Here's another debate that we could engage in for several days. Um, I tend to think the gospel is probably the best single word to sort of capture the theme of Romans. I, I'm impressed by the fact that gospel language occurs quite a lot in the introduction and the conclusion of the letter, the frame of Romans where sometimes these key ideas get introduced. And we'll see that it is the dominant word in 116 to 17, text often singled out as stating the theme of Romans. So Paul's talking about the gospel, the gospel which in its essence has to do with helping sinful human beings gain a relationship with the God of the universe. That's the good news. The good news that God has acted in Jesus Christ the Lord has acted in him in a way that enables human beings, sinful, lost, helpless, to become actual children of God. Uh, that's the essence and heart of the gospel. But Paul is also concerned to show how the gospel is a gospel for all people that it is a word from God, it is good news that brings people together. In Paul's day, that had to do with Jew and Gentile. That was the great dividing line in Paul's world. I don't know what your dividing lines here on Hawaii might be, with different races mixing together, people from different backgrounds. You know, in parts of the US, the dividing line is black and white. Sometimes it's white and Hispanic. Um, increasingly in some parts of the U.S. it's white Asian. We divide and we have these problems with each other and we dispute with each other. And sometimes we're hostile toward each other. The good news is that God has done something in Jesus Christ so that all humans can respond to him and become united around him in a way that just transcends all of these earthly divisions. Uh, I love to speak to a group of Christians like this, different ages, different ethnic backgrounds, obviously, different ages, as the kids fall asleep on me, um, the adults will follow in due course. Uh, I, I love that. It's a picture of what the church is supposed to be, uh, but so often isn't. And again, that's part of what Romans is about the way in which God has acted in Christ to, to extend the boundaries of the people of God to include, in his day, the Gentiles. That was a huge move for the Jews. And in our day, who knows where that goes. So Romans is a book that is written in particular circumstances to Roman Christians about certain issues, and we have to respect that as we interpret the letter. But ultimately, there is a message here that quite transcends those first century Christians. 
a message for us as well. This is how Karl Barth put it, forgive the long quotation here, I'm not a good PowerPoint person, I know you're not supposed to put this many words on a PowerPoint slide, uh, but there it is. Wait till you get Dr. Beal here. Uh, Dr. Beal and I, great, great guy, Greg and I are great friends, he's gonna be here next year for Revelation. He and I were debating one time, um, and um, I used PowerPoint, and, and, and Greg said, oh, that, that's pretty effective, you know, maybe I need to try that. So the next time we had another debate, he had PowerPoint all ready to go. And typical Greg Beal, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when you, when you meet him. Typical Greg Beal, he had all of these PowerPoint slides with about eight point font text. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that bad, but, 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 but this is Karl Barth uh, talking about how ultimately God through Paul is speaking to all of us, that the differences between us and those ancient Roman Christians are to some degree trivial. You know, humans kind of stay the same. They have the same kinds of issues. They might have slightly different names for them. They might take slightly different shapes, but humans are humans. Um, I remember the, the statement of the historian Barbara Tuckman. Revelation, uh, sorry, revolution uh, does not make new men, it just makes different men. You know, we think there's gonna be a revolution and we're gonna change the world. And you know what? Human beings are just kind of stubbornly the same. And the innate sinfulness of our natures emerges just in some new way. So I think Bart is to be indeed heard and welcomed here. We'll be talking about how Romans unfolds as we move through these couple of days, but here's a kind of an overview to get us started uh, as to at least how I would break the letter down and it's to its big chunks. Um, and uh, I, I encourage you as readers of the Bible uh, to uh, uh, take an approach in which you are looking at the big picture and the little picture back and forth. I, I, I'm, my wife and I are photographers, so I think in photographic images here, but, but sometimes you want to put the 24 millimeter lens on. Really wide angle. Get a sense of, you know, where's Romans going as a whole? I want to look at the whole book. And sometimes you want to put the 400 millimeter lens on and say, hey, eh, zero in on this particular word and figure out exactly what's going on with it. Good readers of the Bible will regularly be doing both. Looking at the details and the specifics, but then asking how do those details contribute to the larger argument that God is making here? And in light of that larger argument, what does this detail mean? And it's a back and forth and back and forth. Specifics, general. Detail, broad scope. So here's the broad scope, uh, and we wanna keep this in view even as we look at some of the details. Turn with me now then to Romans 1. Uh, my task in my remaining time is to look at 1, 1 to 17. Um, not sure what Dr. Schreiner is going to do with his time exactly. I'm going to try to combine what I've just described, look at the broader uh, themes perhaps, but then try to focus in on some verses uh, and texts that I think are, are really important for us to understand. So here you have Paul introducing the letter. It breaks down into three obvious parts. Verses one to seven, uh, which basically is simply Paul addressing the Romans. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, then you have eight through 15, Paul's thanksgiving. If you know anything about the letters of Paul, you know this is typically the way he begins. After he introduces himself and addresses the readers, he gives thanks for them. So that's what he does here in 8 through 15. And then 16 to 17 are extremely significant verses. Most people think these verses give an overview of at least some of the key themes of the letter, maybe the theme of Romans as a whole. It's a transitional passage from the introduction to the body. So clearly in 118 we're in the body of the letter. Clearly in 115, we're in the introduction. 
16 and 17 is like a bridge carrying us from that introduction into the body. So we want to look particularly at verses 16 to 17, but a couple of other texts before we do that. 1 to 7. If you look at your Bibles here, you essentially have one sentence beginning in verse 1 and ending in verse 7. Paul to all who are in Rome. You see that? Paul introduces himself, verse 1, and then verse 7, to all of you who are in Rome. That's basically what this section is doing. Paul identifies himself as the sender, and then he talks about who the letter is sent to. But Paul spends quite a bit of time identifying himself here, much more time than he does anywhere else in his letters. Why? Well, remember, this is a group Paul has never met before. These are people he doesn't know. So he spends a little bit more time introducing himself. He says, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus, an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. You see the word gospel here. A gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Have you ever been to the opera? I've been to the Lyric Opera in Chicago a few times. Uh, I don't fit in their seats very well. It's an, odd, it's an old auditorium, and uh, I get tired of my, my knees and my chin the whole time. Uh, but if you've ever been to an opera, it always starts with an overture. What happens in the overture of an opera? Some of the key musical themes that you're going to hear all night long for two or three hours are briefly introduced. That's what Paul's doing here. It's like the overture to the opera. He's saying, here are some things that I want to introduce right now. I want to get out on the table. And you're going to keep hearing about these things again and again. And here's one of them, the gospel promised in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel I am preaching is deeply rooted and connected to God's Old Testament revelation. This is not something entirely new and unexpected. This is deeply rooted in Scripture. And Paul is, is very uh, emphatic about that, and probably it's especially the Gentiles he wants to hear this. You, Gentiles who maybe don't have a lot of background need to realize that there is no good news if it is not deeply attached to the Old Testament revelation of God. This gospel is then verse 3 about God's Son. There is not a lot of what we call Christology in Romans. In other words, there aren't many passages where Paul talks about Jesus himself as he does in Colossians 1 or Philippians 2, for instance. But we shouldn't overlook this passage right at the beginning of the letter. What's the gospel about? It's about the Son, God's Son, who in his earthly life was a descendant of David, that is Messiah, and who now through the spirit of holiness has been appointed the Son of God in power. He's always been Son of God from eternity past. We know that. Second person of the Trinity, God eternal, the second person, the Son. But now as a result of this work of the Spirit and the resurrection, this Son of God now is reigning in power. The word power is going to be picked up in verse 16. The power of the gospel to bring salvation, you see. So the Son. Through this Son, verse 5, Paul says, we've received our apostolic ministry to call the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Now let me just pause on that phrase for a moment. I don't know what versions you have in front of you. I assume the NIV, by far the best Bible in the world. I speak that to my, in front of my colleague, Dr. Schreiner, who's worked on the Christian Standard Bible, so we can have our little debates about that. Uh, but whatever Bible you have before you, I, I suspect if we went around the room, we would find some different options for how this phrase is translated. Of course, that's one of the reasons that it's, it's very enriching to be regularly studying in three or four different versions of the Bible. Because you really get kind of a window into where some of the issues lie when you're reading, let's say, the NIV and you find it translated one way, 
and then you go to the CSB or to the ESV or to the NLT, and you find a different translation there. You know, that's, that, that's just a clue to you. Oh, there's something, something funny going on in the Greek here. <laughs> uh, and people can't quite decide what the meaning is. So uh, that's, that's a very valuable thing to do. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this phrase. It, it, it's, a, it, it's an interesting kind of phrase in Greek where you just put two nouns next to each other. And you have to figure out how they define each other, how they're related to each other. So here puts, Paul puts together obedience and faith. Um, how do they relate to each other? Well, the NIV translates the obedience that comes from faith. The idea here is we come to initial faith in Christ, and out of that faith relationship grows an obedient lifestyle. Clear, important idea. Uh, others think that the obedience is faith. That in this new covenant era, Obedience is no longer obedience to the law so much as it is the obedience that consists in faith. That's what God now commands you to do. Believe. Obedience which is faith. I think myself that these two words are, are simply connected and related in ways that we can't entirely unpack. But I think what, what is clear is Paul wants to say that he sees his mission as calling people both to believe and to obey. These cannot be separated from each other. Uh, and it's not as if we come to Christ and we believe and then we sort of go along for a while and then at some point we decide, oh, I'd better obey also. You hear that sometimes, the idea that discipleship comes only later on or something. No, the minute we believe, our faith is not in a vapor. Our faith is in the Lord, Jesus Christ. And because he's Lord, that immediately, you see, has implications for us. Karl Barth again, if I might quote him, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. I keep saying this century, even though we're 20 years into this one, but I'm dating myself. Karl Barth, commenting on this, this passage, said, Faith and obedience are like thunder and lightning. They're different things, but you never have the one without the other. Uh, thunder and lightning, faith and obedience. All right, verses 8 through 15, the thanksgiving here. Um, uh, Paul indicates uh, his desire to come to Rome, his sense of obligation to preach to both Greeks and non-Greeks, uh, verse 14 and why he wants to come to Rome to preach the gospel to them there. Here is an interesting sort of point that Paul makes implicitly. Do you see what he says? I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Now, back in verses six and seven, he's clearly identified you as people who are Christians. So we should, if we're reading carefully, you see, we should just pause here for a moment. A little bit of a, of a uncertainty here. Uh, why would Paul want to be going to Rome to preach the gospel to people who are Christians? Well, I, I think there might be a little bit of a clue here that Paul's gospel is a little bit bigger than we sometimes think it is especially if we remind ourselves of the faith and obedience emphasis back in verse five. Sometimes we think the gospel is something that just gets us into relationship with God, whereas I think for Paul, the gospel has longer term implications about living lives pleasing to God as well. All right, 16. To 17. Finally, this is where we want to, uh, to sort of dig in a bit more. Uh, again, a text that is often singled out, I think probably accurately, as the theme of Romans. Every phrase and word is important here. And we could easily spend all of our two days just talking about the words in these two verses. We can't do that, obviously. So I am not ashamed of the gospel or the good news. 
because it is the power of God. Bringing salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Again, I want to key in on two or three of these words and phrases. We've talked a little bit already about the good news, the gospel, uh, which Paul picks up, particularly from Isaiah. It's well recognized that for Paul, all the Old Testament is significant for him, but Isaiah, and particularly Isaiah 40 to 66, are especially significant for him. He gets a lot of his words, his theological ideas from that part of the Old Testament scripture. And in the uh, book of Isaiah, you have the prediction of God who will reign as king and that there will be good news brought to the people of Israel. Paul is now saying, you see, that good news has arrived. The good news that Isaiah talked about is here, embodied in Jesus Christ, proclaimed by me and other apostles. These connections of Old Testament and New are always close to the surface in Paul. This good news is the power of God. You see the power, the son of God and power phrase. Remember back in verse four, the connections here. God has now appointed Jesus as son of God in power. And now we have that word power here again. The gospel is the power of God because of Jesus' resurrection. <clears throat> Bringing salvation. We'll talk about salvation more tomorrow. Let me just here get on the uh, sort of uh, our, our get before us. The idea that salvation is not simply getting into a relationship with God. At least in the Christian circles I uh, am in, that's how the language of salvation is often used. When were you saved? People ask me and I'll say, well, I was saved as a senior in college. And save tends to then focus on that moment of conversion. But as we will see in the way Paul uses the language of salvation, it's much bigger than that, focusing often on the end of the process, not the getting in, but the ultimately being vindicated at the very end when God brings us before him for judgment. So it's useful to remind ourselves here that this salvation Paul is talking about is not just initial entry. It's the whole life leading to the ultimate vindication that God has promised us as his people and those who love him. And then the end of 16 touches on this key theme that we've already talked about a little bit. And I love the way Paul here combines universality with particular, with particular, particularity, that's too big a word for me, uh, 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 with, with, with a universal focus, everybody who believes, but then specifically saying, oh, first for the Jew. Now again, if we're reading carefully, and you know, I encourage you when, when you read your Bible to, to read with questions, to read carefully, um, we might wonder about this. Well, how do these fit together, Paul? You're, you're telling me on the one hand, the gospel's for everybody, and then in the next breath, it's first for the Jews. All right, does that mean that there is still a two-stage process here? The Jews are the inner circle, and then the Gentiles are sort of out here somewhere? Is that what you're saying, Paul? Is it truly for everybody if you're making this discrimination? And I think what Paul is doing here, you see, is just getting out there on the table, as it were, an issue that he's going to keep coming back to, not least in Romans 9 through 11. Because that's a lot about what Romans 9 through 11 is about. Is there a first for Israel? What is it? What is its nature? And so forth. Um, yeah, I've got a, um, a slide on this, too. So, inclusive everyone who believes, but exclusive. I'm sorry, inclusive everyone, but exclusive those who believe. 
So with this phrase, we need to combine those as well. There is a tendency, more, more than a tendency, it's a, almost an overwhelming force toward universalism in our world. All religions are the same, many different ways to God. You believe you get to God this way. I believe I get to God this way. That's fine. It's all ultimately the same in the end. We're all going to get there. This universalism. And it's creeping into the Christian church in significant ways. On the one hand, what I want to say here on the basis of what Paul is saying, yeah, there is a universalism in the gospel. It's for everyone. It's to be preached everywhere to everyone without exception or discrimination. But ultimately, those who are saved are those who respond to the message in faith. It's belief that is the point of entry for everybody. Verse 17, why does the gospel have this power? It has this power because the righteousness of God is revealed in it. The righteousness of God is a key phrase in Romans. Paul uses this phrase nine times in his epistles, eight of them in Romans. Nine times in all the letters, all 13 of the letters, eight of them here in Romans. What does it mean? Oh, could I spend some time here? I, all I will say is that briefly, I, I've changed my mind a little bit on this between the first edition of the commentary and the second. Mark had asked us to address some of these issues. Here's one of them. And I've changed my mind largely because of a very, very fine PhD student I've had who's been working on the topic. Uh, in my first edition, I kind of took the righteousness of God to mean God's act of putting people right. I still think that works pretty well, and I still like it, but this student of mine has persuaded me it just, just won't do. <laughs> it just can't explain the evidence. So um, I think, and I think there's a tendency toward this view that righteousness of God is fundamentally more an attribute of God. Uh, but not his attribute of justice, but his attribute of acting according to his own purposes and plan. So it's, it's the righteousness of God that he promised the people of Israel over 50 times in the Old Testament scriptures. We read about God's righteousness. And in several key texts in the Psalms and Isaiah, it's predicted for the future. One day God is going to display his righteousness. He is going to show that he is a faithful, loving God who accomplishes his purposes. In the context of the Old Testament prophecies, that had to do with bringing Israel back from exile. See, Israel's in exile. God has, has sent them there. They, it seems as if God has failed, that Israel has failed. And God says through the prophet, no, I'm going to display my righteousness one day. I'm going to bring Israel back from exile. I'm going to vindicate them. And by vindicating them, I will vindicate my own name, that I am the powerful God of the universe. That's God's righteousness. Well, now again, Paul picks up that language from the OT and says, in the preaching of the gospel, that righteousness of God is being revealed. God's faithfulness to accomplish his purposes for his people. But note this, his people now not defined in terms of ethnic identity, it's not Israel, it's the people defined by faith. Righteousness of God, which is through faith. And here's the other change I have made. In the first edition of the commentary I wrote, by faith from first to last, I sort of went along with the NIV here, took it to mean faith from beginning to end. Uh, again, uh, a fine uh, uh, a couple of articles written by some friends of mine and, and colleagues of mine have convinced me that doesn't work. And so I think this is probably something like from the faith of Jews to the faith of Gentiles, uh, which makes sense, obviously, with this emphasis in the letter. Well, Paul, Paul finalizes all of this by doing something he does again and again in Romans, quotes the Old Testament scripture. The end of verse 17, and again, I hope when you read your Bible, 
uh, whether it's uh, on your, your phones, your iPads, or the old-fashioned way, that you, you track the footnotes. I think Dr. Schreiner will agree with me. Uh, footnotes in your Bibles are very important. They provide really important information. And one of the key information points they provide is, where does this come from in the Old Testament scripture? Footnote, Habakkuk 2.4. We don't have time to do that in these next couple of days, at least very often. But anytime you come to an Old Testament quote in the New, find out where that quote's from and go back and read that Old Testament passage in its context. I guarantee you, you will often be amazed at the connections you will begin to see, at the links between Old and New that you never saw before. So we don't have time to do that here. But what, briefly, what God is doing in uh, the prophecy of Habakkuk is trying to assure the prophet uh, that despite a lot of evidence to the contrary, God is still on his throne and is still accomplishing his purposes. And the person who is righteous will live by faith, the faith that God indeed is who he says he is and that he will do the things he has promised to do.